Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to get started, so don't let me stop you from finishing up with food. My name is Will Ray, and on behalf of the Federal Society, welcome. Before I introduce our eminent speakers, I'll briefly introduce the group. A lot of people have questions about the Federal Society. One of the first ones is, who's that on your logo? It's actually Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> when the group first started, we had rather low funds. His silhouette was a lot cheaper, so we went with that. Um, when I try to explain the Federal Society, I often use this quotation. The wisdom and the discretion of Congress, their identity with the people, and the influence which their constituents possess at elections are in this, as in many other instances, the sole restraint on which they rely to secure them from its abuse. Now, there are many different types of the Federalist Society, liberal, libertarian, and conservative. But one thing that they tend to share is that that quote makes them a little, makes them a little uneasy. Because according to Federalists, you remember that we the people signed a deal. We had a contract. We call it the Constitution, not because it's sacred, but that's just what you call a contract when you sign it between the government. And it wasn't a perfect deal. We didn't all along to be back in 1776. The nice thing about the Constitution is that it says right in it how to change it. You don't even need to have a copy anymore. You can just Google it. And those times when we did change the Constitution, well, I think they are some of the proudest moments in our nation's history. It required a lot. It required blood, tears, in some cases, years of injustice and protest. But then we wrote down the lessons we learned in black and white so that the people that followed us had the benefit of our wisdom and the knowledge of our true consensus. As much as we respect them, we know that nothing is said in the Constitution without allowing these nine unelected judges to change it. And so until we the people decide otherwise, we like to hold on to the rights that we thought we had when we signed that contract. Like the right to grow food, <coughs> which in the 40s was run into jeopardy by Wilfred B. Filburn. Or the privileges that we thought we had. Like the right for each state to primarily govern itself, to experiment and to tinker with the proper balance of social forces, even if sometimes they fail. <laughs> because the states were never meant to be mules driven by our incompetent federal masters. You're meant to be more like this guy, or girl. <laughs> Think about wild horses that when the herd is threatened, they run together, and nobody stands in their way. The same holds true for the United States of America. In the meantime, somebody needs to stand over our guards. Somebody needs to stand guard over our freedom. The threat we face now is not war, but the internal threat that comes from men of good intentions, impatient with the slowness of persuasion, an example to achieve the great social changes they envision. They try to use the power of the state to achieve their interests. But if they gain the power, they fail to accomplish those great social goals that they try to. According to Friedman, they produce a collective state from which they would recoil and poor, and of which they would be among the first victims. We need your help. We're looking for one L reps right now. So if you're interested, please email me at wkray at gmail.com or James Oliveira if you have his email. We need your help on which speakers to bring to campus, everything from what food we have to what other events we should do. We're having a blood drive on October 4th and 5th. We could really use your help to donate there. If we get over 35 people, we've already broken the record. So if you're interested, just contact one of these five handsome people and uh, let them know that you want to help out. And yes, it's not Colin Lynch there, but he wouldn't send me a headshot. <laughs> that guy looks kind of similar. You didn't tell me what you needed it for. I trust you. Yeah, you so now to our speakers. First, I'm going to introduce Professor Eugene Kontorovich. Professor Kontorovich went to the University of Chicago for both undergraduate and law school. Afterwards, he clerked for Judge Posner on the Seventh Circuit. You may recognize that name from roughly every third opinion in your case. <laughs> Professor Kontorovich, who now teaches at Northwestern, writes extensively on piracy, maritime law, 
and also has a significant body of work on the legal aspects of the Israel Air. Next is our hometown hero, Professor Gutoff. Professor Gutoff went to Brown, where he majored in classics, and he too earned his JD from the University of Chicago. Based on this, we have to assume that's the primary locus for fire attacks. <laughs> Professor Gutoff is one of the nation's top experts on piracy and maritime law. He was the acting director, and is now a faculty member of Roger Williams Law Mar Marine Affairs. Uh, what and when this was first being organized by the Federalist Society, I was asked to know if I'd be debating people, and I said, you know, I'm familiar with Professor Kantorovich's work, and I don't think so. I'm very much in agreement with um, his legal conclusions. If anyone in this audience will be uh, taking my seminar, the one credit class, um, it will be assigned reading. So I, I, I think it's a really wonderful um, and sophisticated exposition of the current law and some of the current legal problems. And, and I certainly have um, nothing to disagree with uh, with what the captain said, um, and, nothing but ad oh, no, and, and nothing but admiration for um, he and the men who are undertaking the legal prosecutions of uh, these very, very dangerous people. What I would like to do, and this has to do with the um, scholarly background from which I've approached this problem, is not as an international lawyer, but as someone interested in private law, <laughs> private maritime law, and um, procedural history. And what I'd like to throw out two ideas, and I'm happy to hear the responses of you and my fellow panelists, is that on one level, this is not primarily a legal problem, um, and, and that historically it's not been a problem which has admitted of primarily or even at all a legal solution. Secondly, I'd like to um, propose, and very briefly, that this is to a very large extent, though it's absolutely horrible for the sailors who are subject to this or in the case of the quest, the um, humanitarian um, civilians who were uh, subject to attack and murder uh, in the Indian Ocean. In terms of global maritime commerce, um, it doesn't pose as big a threat um, to cause the same sort of concerns that it might have in the 19th and 18th centuries, and in particular, it perhaps should not cause as big concern in the United States or um, in many countries of the European Union, whose merchant fleets are certainly much less significant than they were in the um, 18th and 19th centuries. So uh, as a historic matter, piracy has been a problem as long as people have been shipping. In fact, piracy was probably the first large-scale form of organized crime as a vessel was for many thousands of years, not just hundreds of years, until really the advent of the corporate form of doing business, the largest concentration of wealth in the world. Um, the largest single commercial enterprise would be found in a commercial uh, merchant ship. Yeah. Just Going back a little bit further than um, the captain, the Romans had to deal with it. So, uh, and they were obviously not burdened by our ideas of due process. You know, famously, Pompey um, uh, was sent on an expedition to the Eastern Mediterranean to suppress piracy. He was given authority by the people of Rome, acting through their tribune, uh, to take full control of the seas in anywhere inland 50 miles. Probably a little less than 50 US miles, but still, great deal. Ancient historians record that he defeated the pirate fleet and resettled them as farmers inland. Um, some modern scholarship tends to set out the policy that the Romans probably just bought them off. But in any case, piracy was suppressed without huge numbers of um, anything that we would call legal prosecutions um, 
non-Roman citizens were not entitled to appeal for legal protection uh, to Rome. But they were all, as Julius Caesar famously had promised his captors, they were crucified. Uh, moving ahead to um, the 18th century, you know, including Blackbeard, this is a huge explosion of piracy with the conclusion of um, wars between France and Spain, a lot of unemployed um, people with military training at sea, um, and hugely increased commerce as England um, won the right especially to um, import slaves into the Spanish territories at the start of the 18th century, which is to a very large extent what they had been fighting England over for the preceding two centuries. So, famous English national sea hero, Sir John Hawkins, was basically trying to bring enslaved Africans to Mexico and sell them there um, without permission of the Spanish authorities. With this huge explosion of international piracy, new legal tools were thought to be needed, um, and Parliament passed a statute allowing for trials outside of England at a variety of places, vice admiralty courts, there was one down the road in Newport, one in the Bahamas, one in Africa, one in um, <clears throat> Calcutta. And they would try these cases, They, just as today, there was a problem getting live evidence. And well, lots <coughs> of people were tried and hanged. There were numerous acquittals. Um, Numerous people were acquitted because they had turned state's evidence. Numerous people were acquitted because the non-jury tribunals that were hearing them simply believed the same story people are giving today, that they had been captured by pirates and forced to serve on a pirate vessel. So um, uh, at the trial that's generally thought to conclude this sort of so-called golden age of piracy, so called the golden age of piracy because it's the one that people think of as the basis for most fictional depictions of piracy, you know, from Johnny Depp to Peter Pan. Um, and there was a trial that resulted in sort of a mass hanging of 55 pirates of uh, Cape Coast Castle in what would now be Ghana, uh, it was the major British slaving station uh, in uh, West Africa. On the other hand, there were about 120 acquittals. I mean, some of those because the people had turned state's evidence, some of them because the court believed, which was made, mainly made up of naval officers, the court believed that uh, they had been forced into piracy. At that point, the prosecution of piracy goes into sort of abeyance as the problem of piracy goes into abeyance until the start of the 19th century um, when you have two events in two separate parts of the world important to both British and American shipping. In the Atlantic and Caribbean, you have the Latin American Wars of Independence causing the disintegration of Spanish sovereignty uh, in Latin America. And the Greek War of Independence, also you know, starting somewhat later, about starting in the 1820s, I mean, concluding in the 1830s where the Greeks with some European support um, established their independence from what was then the Ottoman Empire. And again, no state was sort of sovereign over the Balkan Peninsula for about a decade and a half. What you had then were an explosion of people getting either fake or licenses to plunder enemy shipping or licenses issued in bad faith to plunder enemy shipping that these sort of new republics, the Republic of Cartagena, which is what now we call Colombia, would just was trying to raise money and told people, mainly come from the American city of Baltimore, um, hey, if you'd like a license to plunder Spanish shipping, one could be had for a pretty reasonable price. <laughs> this and, and the same thing was happening in the Mediterranean because the United States and England were incredibly active in um, both the Atlantic and the Mediterranean, making up for well over 50% of the merchant shipping um, in the Eastern Mediterranean and in the Atlantic. Both our navies you know, actively start to suppress them. This is where the first 
Um, piracy prosecution comes out of Smith, was not, no, he was not a Spaniard, he was not a Latin American. He was someone who claimed he had been given permission to attack enemy shipping, and that's what he thought he was doing. Uh, on the American side, this resulted in very, very few prosecutions and convictions. Um, on, on the English side, very few convictions in the Caribbean, no convictions in um, the Mediterranean. By this point, England had decided to allow jury trials for um, piracy prosecutions. Pirates were tried in Malta. The Maltese were somewhat resentful of um, England for occupying Malta. I mean, just this, the, the Maltese is apparently a very difficult language to learn. It's um, like Italian vocabulary with Arabic grammar. And uh, <laughs> nonetheless, piracy was suppressed in both Greece and Latin America by the end of the 1840s. And the reason for that is both Greece and the newly formed Latin American republics started to take responsibility for the conduct of their newly found citizens um, on an international level. So in the Eastern Mediterranean, um, England told um, the Greek government that unless it managed to control piracy, it would occupy Greek harbors, which was not, nothing that the um, newly formed Greek government wanted, having just sort of relieved itself from what it saw as the burden and what undoubtedly was the burden of Ottoman colonialism. Uh, a similar thing happened in uh, Latin America when the very long civil wars that they lost into the 1840s stopped. Piracy stopped too. Colombia, newly formed, Venezuela, Argentina, all want to start taking responsibility for their actions as um, citizens under American law. A similar th situation happens with the Barbary pirates, or somewhat earlier, but nearly contemporaneous. That Prior to American independence, the normal way of dealing with Barbary predation by both England and France and the Netherlands was to pay tribute to these kingdoms which did not articulate that they were engaging in piracy. They claimed that they were engaging in religious war against non-adherents um, of Islam. But they say that no, only adherents of Islam could sail in the Mediterranean and off the west coast of Africa, you were not you were engaging in an act of war. And England regularly paid tribute. Um, there's lots of interesting historical documentation about how the return of captives to England was generally celebrated by a Thanksgiving Mass at St. Paul's Cathedral in London as a demonstration of the beneficence of the monarch. Uh, after 1783, when this country gains its independence, we're no longer covered by the tribute payments of England. And so the Barbary nations uh, feel free to attack us, and we don't have a treaty with you. We, we could attack you. We solve this problem not through extensive trials of people, either in the Mediterranean or certainly in the 18th century. I think no one would have imagined engaging in a fairly lengthy transatlantic voyage with a bunch of you know, hostile combatants. Um, we cannonaded Tripoli until they agreed to uh, enter into a treaty with the United States whereby they would not engage in acts of predation against their ships. We didn't care about French shipping. We didn't care about English shipping. France eventually attempted to solve the problem by colonizing, or at least claiming cesaranity over much of North Africa, which is why they form part of sort of Francophone Africa to this day, and um, you know, until the 1960s, France claimed Algeria, the main Barbary state, as simply part of metropolitan France, you know, uh, leading obviously to the Algerian War of Independence. The problem in Somalia strikes me as very similar to what you had in Greece and Latin America prior to the formation of stable Greek and Latin American countries. Uh, the problem, I don't think, is the legal tools, which I think are being excellently used. I think, 
and, and this is where I absolutely agree with uh, Professor Kantorovich, that we're not willing to spend the money to solve the problem, which to some extent is understandable because I don't think the problem lies seaward. I think it lies landward. I think it's wonderful that um, the US Navy, and I would hope other navies uh, follow the lead, start to take advantage of both the UN Security Council resolution and the invitation of what counts as the Somali government to please come in and deal with these people. They're totally destabilizing Somali society. I mean, just as um, the drug trade has destabilized several Central American countries. It's, it's this influx of illicit, untaxed cash that's going to support criminal elements who are not controllable by you know, the putative sovereign of Somalia or even the putative sovereign of Puntland, the little region that claims independence uh, in, in, in northern Somalia. I think, and this is I think an intractable problem, unless you can control Somalia itself, everything else is just very large extent window dressing. Um, the Indian Ocean, as we've learned, is far too big a space um, for the United States or the European Union, or even the United States, the European Union, the Russian Federation, India, and China, to so mention other countries with a large number of naval assets available, for them all to patrol unless they want to grossly exceed um, their national defense budgets. Or, or no. And so I, I, I think, you know, I was going to say famously, but I realized nobody reads the Bramble Bush. This is I was talking to somebody, you know, it's like maybe somebody has. Carl Lowen said it's important to realize there's so much outside law. And while we could talk about what is a good procedure for trying pirates, where should they be tried, uh, you know, how should they be tried, what should the burden of evidence be, uh, the English were able effectively to suppress pirates with what looked very much like common law criminal trials at the time. In fact, the 19th century looked more or less probably like common law criminal trials today, except for the right of the defendant to give evidence, which I'm guessing in the pirate trials isn't commonly taken advantage of, but I don't know. Uh, um, and I, I don't think it's the problem with the legal tools. What I'd like to go on to, and I hope I haven't taken too much time, I probably have, but uh, is is just to point out at least a somewhat dramatic disconnect between who's spending money on naval assets and whose merchant shipping is being threatened. Um, and in the 19th century, the United Kingdom controlled over half the merchant tonnage in the world. The United States was the next most important um, carrier of cargo until the Civil War. Okay, at which point Union um, shipping suffered gravely at, at the hands of legitimate, at least just recognized legitimate by all the other countries of the world, Confederate attacks on um, northern merchant shipping. It was for this reason that the United States was concerned about suppressing piracy in the Caribbean. It was for this reason that Britain was concerned about suppressing piracy in the Eastern Mediterranean their main trade route before the construction of the Suez Canal with India. Uh, if you look at um, the reports of piracy, which are probably underreported because people don't want to get in trouble with their insurance companies, uh, very, very little merchant shipping is the United States. The Mirsk, Alabama was an exception because it was carrying US funded humanitarian aid. Almost all of uh, the transshipment of cargo is done by very small countries with few or no naval assets. So if you look at reports of countries that have suffered the most pirate attacks, it's Liberia, Panama, and the Bahamas. I mean, again, and they're all three countries, and indeed Mongolia, all countries have the right to register and flag their own vessels. I would like to suggest that to the extent those countries take regulatory responsibility for those vessels, especially labor regulatory responsibility for those vessels, which is why 
people plug their vessels in Mongolia, a country without any access to any body of water whatsoever, uh, is not to be subject to European Union um, or United States labor or workplace safety regulations. Uh, those countries should take, as the United Nations has indeed encouraged them to do, take some responsibility for bearing the cost of control and prosecution of piracy. The last point that I'll make very quickly is that to some extent this is numerically probably a greater problem than it was in the 18th century um, or 19th century. Comparatively, it's not as big a problem. Uh, merchant shipping worldwide has exploded since the 1980s. And even taking piracy account since 1980, the amount of stolen and culprit cargo has dropped dramatically, again, thanks to the Coast Guard, especially most recently, um, with containerization. It, it used to be before cargo was packed into those big mirror square evergreen boxes that you see going up and down I-95, that about 10% of cargo shipped into the United States would be lost due to theft. I mean, no, anyone who's seen Goodfellas can imagine how this works. A prank disappears. It's now very hard for a container to disappear. Containers can't be taken off ships without a container crane. No one, certainly since September 11th, can access um, a container in the customs yard. So I inquired sometime in the middle of the decade if I could take you know, a class that I was teaching on um, carriage of goods up to you know, the container yard in Boston, I realized it would require more paperwork, and, and rightly so. You know, a bunch of unidentified people should not be able to walk around <laughs> what at any given time are hundreds of millions of dollars worth of cargo, but cargo, you know, cargo pilferage in the United States has dropped to about less than 1%. But most of it, my understanding is, and from what I read, I'm happy to be corrected by the captain, takes place in the port of Los Angeles, where, where it's probably funded by Mexican drug gangs using inside jobs, not on board vessels, but with the trucking companies. As, as I was at a colloquium this uh, past week where someone was discussing, you know, they always say, it's, you know, the truck drivers always say, someone stole my car at gunpoint, but it's always the trucks carrying the containers with the iPads and the plasma TVs, <laughs> never the trucks with the containers filled with alpha, alpha pellets or scrap metal. I mean, so again, not, again, that's not good. That's something that should not be tolerated. The FBI should certainly investigate it. But given the huge amount, approximately two thirds of the world's gross domestic product is carried by ocean carriage to that some pilferage takes place either at sea or you know, off you know, the Pacific Coast Highway south of Long Beach is going to be inevitable. And, and I would like to suggest that given the limited military resources available and given the limited law enforcement resources available to this country, um, it might be better if um, attention were paid to other problems that are more pressing. So thank you, and I'll turn this over to our guest, uh, Professor Kantorovich. Thank you so much. Uh, how much time do I have? Well, the audience might have to trickle out to make classes, but... Uh, Please, please trickle. Uh, okay, so in, in, in the interest of uh, time, I'll try to go fast. Uh, and again, I uh, absolutely agree with uh, everything Professor Goodhoff said, and we'll try to emphasize some different points. Uh, in particular, what I want to emphasize is the lessons that we can learn about the current struggle with Somali piracy for other, other legal questions and other areas in particular of international law. So we can learn things maybe about other, other international crimes. Piracy is the paradig paradigmatic international crime. About other kinds of uh, struggles with non-traditional enemies, like let's say uh, illegal combatants currently held in Guantanamo. 
uh, and, and maybe a few other points. So for international law, piracy is a great case study because it's the paradigmatic international crime. So today, international criminal law has taken a, a big purview for itself. It uh, wishes to address some of the gravest wrongs and injustices in the world, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, genocide, and to deter and stop these things through the mechanisms of law and justice, the International Criminal Court being the institutional crystallization of this goal and desire. Piracy is where it all starts. Piracy was the first recognized international crime. And for centuries, it was the only real recognized international crime for which you would have universal jurisdiction. That is to say, the notion that these crimes are of, a, of, a, uh, of the right magnitude or nature that any nation can prosecute the perpetrators even if they have no connection. Britain can prosecute Spanish perpetrators, pirates, etc., and with no objection from the home nation. We're not going to be proprietary, we're not going to be ter uh, territorial about this. That didn't actually happen so often, but at least in theory, that was the case. And universal jurisdiction that the Nuremberg uh, Tribunal and then American courts and uh, other cases applied was specifically they invoked this precedent of piracy. That's what we're building on. So we can maybe learn uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit about uh, potential successes of today's more ambitious efforts. Indeed, you'd think piracy would also be the easiest, if you have a list, piracy, ethnic cleansing, genocide, the easiest international crime to deal with. Because the pirates, they're only really in it for the money. Now, as a result, because they have no ideology, they don't have any sympathizers. They don't have any useful idiots. They don't have any state sponsors. Uh, they don't, uh, because they're not really trying to do anything other than buy some mansions and retire to Paris, uh, you're not, you know, no one would think, no one is really interested uh, in them winning. Whereas any kind of terrorist group, any kind of war crime, war, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, genocide always take place in the context of a struggle for power and authority between two groups. And they're usually about something. And when you're about something, people are going to, you're going to have sympathizers, allies. Uh, the pirates, uh, so the, the pirates have no sympathizers, they have no armies, they're not in charge of countries people who commit war crimes, genocide, ethnic cleansing, uh, generally tend to be. Um, they really you know, don't, don't have much the, more than these AK-47s and RPGs, so it should be easy. And if it's not easy, then we should worry about uh, our success with the more ambitious agenda. Okay, now, uh, the, the captain uh, had a wonderful presentation about the efforts that the Navy is taking uh, at prosecuting those people who the Navy is prosecuting. Uh, the, the U.S. government is prosecuting, uh, which generally, which are those people, those pirates who have attacked U.S. vessels. Uh, so I want to talk about the bigger picture, which in no way takes away from the wonderful uh, work that the Navy is doing, of the pirates caught. So uh, in 2008 is when the Somali piracy took off. Uh, it doubled that year from previous levels. And when I mean Somali piracy, I mean piracy by Somalis, which is now halfway to India in its geographic scope. Uh, and then so the international community said, we're going to deal with this. We have the legal tools. Right? We've, we've discussed that. We have universal jurisdiction. We have the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. We have these Security Council treaties. In 2008, the Security Council passed four Chapter 7 Security Council resolutions, uh, more than for any other international problem other than the Israeli issue. Uh, so it was taken very seriously. Uh, 2009, piracy doubles from the previous year. <laughs> 2010, it kind of levels off, but their ransoms go up, which suggests that, should suggest that they're still doing well. Uh, and really, no significant dent has been put in it. Government authorities like to say we're actually doing better and point to a lower success rate. So of total attacks, the percentage of successful seizures is down. But that doesn't really seem to be a problem for the pirates' point of view, because their ransoms are still going up. So they're just you know, shifting to a more volume kind of business. Uh, you know, there's a lot of dry holes in the piracy business. So here's the shocking statistic. And this is the, the other 90% from uh, what the captain was talking about. Uh, estimates, uh, so 30, 30 navies, 30-some uh, 30 nations have assets uh, hunting down these pirates, uh, including some 
Western NATO, NATO, Western NATO nations, China in their first outer region deployment in 500 years. Um, for anyone who is anyone in the maritime world is, is working on this. Uh, of the and they catch tons of pirates. They probably actually caught all the pirates. So how can I say they've caught all the pirates when they have all these pirates? So of the pirates that are caught, over 90% are released. That is to say, you know, they're given a meal, they're put back in the ship. If their ship is no longer seaworthy, they're given a tow uh, as distressed mar mariners. Uh, and you say, goodbye, have a nice day. See you next time. As a matter of fact, the Royal Navy, which, uh, as the captain mentioned, once so boldly defied Blackbeard and others, uh, Royal Navy actually has a directive from the Foreign Office that they actually cannot put the pirate on board and give him a meal and send him back because he might claim asylum as soon as he, under, <laughs> under their interpretation of European asylum laws, as soon as he is on that vessel, it, it's, it's over. So, of these pirates who attack the quest, pirates who attack other vessels, pirates currently being prosecuted in the United States, statistically likely that they had already been in custody, if not of the United States, or certainly of one of the other allied nations, and released. So, uh, why, why is that, why is that happening? That, that, that's a little bit shocking. What's the point of all this universal jurisdiction if you're not going to um, use it, uh, other than the, the uh, it sounds nice to think that such a thing exists. Um, so, again, uh, as has been stressed before, the progressive development of modern international law has in some ways set back the efforts to deal with basic international crimes. So under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, pirates are clearly civilians, you can't just blow them away, uh, as was uh, previously uh, the case when you encounter them on the high seas. They need to be treated as criminals. So doing that is really not so simple. Proving someone a pirate is really hard. Now, the Navy has done a wonderful job in these cases. These cases, however, are the, the exception that proves the rule. But there are usually two kinds of ways you can find pirates. Either they have made it on board a vessel, which is unusual, in which case it's a hostage situation. And so the, the cases America is prosecuting are atypical because they actually attack naval vessels. So that, that, that's not going to go well for the main. Uh, no matter how, that's just never going to work out. And that's what makes them so atypical. Usually when they get on board a civilian vessel, what is going to happen, 99 times out of 100, is the insurers, if not the home government, are going to drop a big barrel of cash on them from a helicopter. Uh, and that's, it's a hostage situation. No one's going to try to do anything about it, uh, lest it go sideways. And so that's one kind of situation in which you have pirates. Once they're on the ship, okay. So then other, other ways is you just see some guys in the sea and they have RPGs and coalition accounts, but you know, actually it's very hard to be a Somali fisherman without some protection. Dollar <laughs> counting machines are generally a giveaway. Um, but there is no, so under international law, there is no international law against being guys with guns uh, in the Gulf of Aden. That's not against international law. And they do have these excuses, which are very much like the, if you, if you talk to the people at Guantanamo, they were tourists, aid workers, religious students, etc. And it's hard to be in Afghanistan without a coalition of government, so they have them. So they have the same excuse. And if you just encounter them in the high seas, there's really not much one can do with them with, uh, in a way that would be very, that would be easy to prove. Uh, it's not very easy to get Somali interpreters, a, ma a, ma a major problem. Uh, so it's expensive, it's not easy, uh, a huge burden. So the United States Navy uh, has, has, has these wonderful lawyers who can do this, but it's not cheap. And then there's, the, then there's the transitional case. The transitional case is when they're actually speeding to the vessel and not on. That's great. So that's when you have all this camera footage, you can see what they're doing, you can prove that they're doing something, but it's not yet a hostage situation. There's about you know, a 15 minute to a half hour window there from when they make their approach. But it's a big ocean, it's very rare that anyone's gonna encounter them. Uh, in that in that time, so and it's expensive. It's hard to prove. They have these stories. You have to fly around witnesses, find witnesses, all of which is nice. When uh, if your own warship is attacked, you're going to spend the money. Right? That's kind of you violate so many parts of the U.S. code when you shoot over the U.S. <laughs> you can't let that kind of thing slide. But it turns out that nations, even the nations so committed to the idea of universal jurisdiction and international justice, the European nations. Britain, Belgium, Holland, 
uh, stay leaders in the effort to promote universal jurisdiction, it turns out that they're really not so interested in applying it when it will cost them direct money. That's one problem. Proving it hard, complicated, but there's a much bigger problem. What if they actually succeed in the prosecution? That's what everyone's really afraid of. Because then you might have a permanent pirate population. So, why permanent? So, in Europe, they're going to do five to seven years, which seems to be the typical European sentence for piracy. Uh, and then they're out. They haven't even seen their 30th birthday. And they're going to apply for asylum, as the pirates in Holland and Germany already have. Um, they're going to apply for family reunification, as the pirates are being tried in Holland. And the only reason that pirates are being tried in Holland and Germany, by the way, this doesn't contradict what I was saying earlier, there was a group, there were some pirates who accidentally at attacked a Dutch Antilles flagged vessel, and some pirates that attacked a, a German vessel. Uh, and they, they, want the, they want the whole village brought over. And they have some good arguments for why that should happen, by the way. Um, the, nobody, wants, nobody wants these people. Uh, there are, I've heard estimates, 10 to 15,000 gunmen on the spot market in Mogadishu. That is, those not permanently aligned with any faction. So, even if you catch uh, about maybe a few thousand people involved in piracy in Poland and Somaliland, but presumably there's a replenishable supply. And as the, as the German, and nobody wants a popular, you know, it's expensive to house these people, it's expensive to feed the, these people. They're all Muslim. In, uh, uh, in some sense, and there's a concern that this will aggravate tensions, and some of them have already started uh, using Quran burning uh, arguments, also re reminiscent of Guantanamo. Uh, Kenya, which had been prosecuted, which had taken the lead in prosecuting these, uh, in a process that seems very similar to what would be called rendition, except everyone thought it was a good idea, uh, all the European nations in America signed deals where Kenya would prosecute everyone's pirates. But they got sick of that for a variety of reasons, uh, one of which they immediate neighbors of, Somali, of, of Somalia uh, and are worried about uh, al-Shabaab making inroads, and there's a large Somali population in uh, Kenya. They were, uh, they were worried about that. So in other words, international justice carries some costs. They're not huge costs. And they seem higher, however, than anyone has been willing to entertain. Um, and we see how progressive elements of international law, broad asylum rights, etc., are in tension with other parts of the international legal agenda, classic parts, i.e. prosecuting pirates. By the way, I think it's not such a tragedy that these pirates aren't being prosecuted broadly, because there's a serious reverse deterrence problem. So if you are negative deterrence, so average lifespan in Somalia for a guy is in the low 40s, and the average uh, per capita income is about $400, $500. Uh, so you're going to make more than that, you know, working in the prison cafeteria in Germany. Uh, and certainly your life expectancy in medical care is going to go up a great deal. And, you know, I've talked to the lawyers for these people who have been tried in Germany and on. They're, they're happy. Uh, they're, and their principal concern is not their sentence, but the subsequent prospects for asylum. Um, and they're really stunned that the lawyer works for them for free, and they're, they're really, they could not be more surprised, actually, at the situation. Um, that, that, so that's a reverse deterrence possibility. It's not really clear that if, so if, if two things can happen to you, you can succeed, in which case the low guy on the totem pole gets a $10,000 payday, uh, or you could fail, in which case you spend uh, five to seven years in Holland, in a Dutch prison, it's not clear which, you know, whether any of this is providing, uh, is providing uh, deterrence. Uh, the Chinese have a different approach, as do the Malay. Most of the Asian countries take a much, uh, a much tougher approach, but they're only getting into the uh, prosecution in, 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 in earnest. Um, OK, so it's, where do we stand today? So there the are several ideas here, and then I'll just uh, suggest another solution. So at the time when international law has claimed for itself the power and ability to bring the world together where everyone will ignore national self-interest and bring the world's most grave perpetrators to justice, no matter what it costs them, it turns out that they, they cannot uh, take care of the most classic and basic international crime. It's like the DA. So you know, when you're going after the, uh, what do you call it, Pinochets of the world but can't deal with the pirates, uh, it's like the DA who only wants to do celebrity murders or sex crimes and not just uh, deal with ordinary money. Uh, and it also suggests 
that when these nations do use universal jurisdiction, when they say, oh, we have, you know, we have nothing to do with this crime, but we just have to prosecute it because international <coughs> law says we do, that there may be something political or manipulative about it. There was this really crystallized, uh, in I believe late 2009, early 2010, when uh, Spain caught some pirates, and there was a very entrepreneurial, ambitious prosecutor who wanted to actually prosecute these pirates even though they had not attacked a uh, Spanish vessel. They were indicted, and the judge dismissed the indictment, saying, what does this have to do with Spain? I mean, I understand universal jurisdiction, that it's possible and whatnot, but surely this is a misuse of our resources. This was thousands of miles away. At the same time, another Spanish judge uh, opened a new stage in an investigation of an uh, attack, uh, an aerial uh, targeted killing of a Hamas leader in Gaza that happened 10 years ago, which was even further, about as far from Spain, and certainly temporarily more remote. Um, so it suggests the politicization of international justice, because of course pirates are the least, if you want to show that international criminal law could be done in a non-political way, I, you'd start with pirates, because as mentioned, they have no friends. Okay, <laughs> what, what, can be, uh, what can be done? Actually, they buy themselves a lot of friends uh, with, with, the, with the money they have. Uh, what can be done about this? So, Historically, when there were pirate problems, no merchant vessel would ever think of taking to sea without at least some light armor. armor. It would be crazy. Just like if you, if you had a few million dollars and you were going to a bad neighborhood, you'd never think that that would be unguarded. And the, 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 the dilemma of the Somali pirate is almost, you know, it's, it's unspeakably stark. I would, I would be a Somali pirate. Yeah? So here you are, you're making $400 a year. And you see hundreds of millions of dollars float by every day. And as if that's not bad enough, entirely unguarded. These vessels have absolutely no guards. Are they on? And that is not. That is partially a policy choice. The the good. The partially the owners would like to shift the costs to uh, national government. They would like to have the navy do it for them, which is not a good thing. Uh, and then national governments, when you, when you hear, to start, want to talk about an international court, that of course would not answer any questions because the international court still has to have a jail which would be in a place. And since there's no place called international land, we'll have all the same problems. Uh, but there's some bad reasons. So, some ships have wanted to have armed security guards and it turns out to be legally very problematic. Uh, so most nations don't let, uh, do not allow armed vessels on, on the ships. And basically, this has to do with the American attitude towards people with guns is exceptional. And when you go to piracy conferences uh, in Europe, or with Europeans, <laughs> Europeans like, we, we just, the idea that people can have guns and just use self-defense is not something they're comfortable with. What are the rules of engagement? What if they accidentally shoot the wrong people? This really, this troubles the Europeans. And uh, ships stop in ports, and ports are part of a country. And that country has laws, which apply equally in the port. And if that country is not the United States, those will almost certainly say people cannot have guns. So I know a guy who does well, part of his maritime security business is when the ship transits the Suez Canal, he drops a bag of guns, not very expensive, Glocks or something, and then something. They, and then they, when they, they do some port calls, uh, and before they get to the ports, which are going to cause them a problem, they drop it overboard, and then they repeat the process. So. The company that hires him obviously really feels the security is important. Other people would do the same if costs were reduced. Uh, now, countries like India, non-European countries with significant maritime interests, India has great been relaxing their approach to uh, private military contractors and other security forces. Uh, Europe is interested, but they, 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 they have this kind of uh, aversion. Fact, no ship with an embarked armed security team has ever been successfully taken. Um, it obviously does not solve all the problems. But it is clearly the single cheapest solution, uh, and does the and, and like uh, the professor mentioned, it focuses the costs on the cheapest cost avoiders and the people who are otherwise benefiting from opting into these lax regulatory regimes and are now crying to the American Navy because they're let's say American owners, uh, but they've chosen a, a foreign flag. But this is something that they could do, which is clearly the, cheap, the, the, cheap, the cheapest method, and is an area where the law could step out of the way uh, and at least not make the problem worse. Okay, I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. Uh, I'm a 